So a man was studying his family tree and discovered that his great-great-grandfather, Uncle Willie, was a notorious cattle rustler who was hung for stealing cattle. And when he was executed, the crowd erupted in applause. He was just hated. He didn't know how to include this in the family history he was writing, so he, tried to, he decided to write it this way. Uncle Willie, great-great-grandfather Uncle Willie, was in the cattle business, and he died suddenly when he fell from a platform at a large public gathering. <laughs> I don't know who's in your family tree, but most of us have some. And that sort of gets us talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're often mentioned together, and uh, tonight we're going to look at the three of them, it's, uh, uh, but it's interesting. And they've got some questionable characters in the family, to be sure. But what intrigues me about Scripture is that rather than glossing over the cattle thieves in the family, the Bible highlights it. It does not hide these rascals. It lets us see their flaws. So uh, uh, that's, that's part of the message of Genesis. All right, well, let's dive in. Um, we're, gonna, we're looking at chapter 26. I know that at the end of chapter 25, Jacob and Esau are born. We're going to come back to that next week and pick that up. But we're going to study Isaac tonight and then move from Isaac to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three. That's, I think it'll work. If, I think it'll work. Um, uh, yeah, it is well, well, well with my soul. Why did I t title it that? This is just how my sick brain works. But Isaac is known for wells, and not one well, but four. At least that's what we know. He's really that's the only thing we know about Isaac. He was a good well digger. It's, this is the, we know a lot about Abraham. We know a lot about Jacob. But Isaac is sort of this invisible link. And I think part of the message of Isaac's life is he's the invisible patriarch. And I don't know if you ever feel invisible in the story God may be writing, but uh, sometimes we've got fathers or grandfathers that are larger than life, and we just sort of are in their shadow. Well, that's Isaac. That's Isaac. And so he's famous for being unfamous, I think. He, he can dig wells. <laughs> you have to love the guy. Okay. Let, um, I'm going to read it in segments, and we're going to talk about it. Let's read the first five verses. Um, now, there was a famine in the land, which, if you remember the text, should have a flashback. Anybody remember where else this was said, almost in those words? Abraham. And I think that's a deliberate flashback. So there's a, this is about 75 years later. Now there's another famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech. Abraham also went to Gerar to Abimelech 75 years earlier. Probably was Abimelech's father or grandfather who happened to have the same name. But it was in Gerar. It was Abimelech. Abraham went there. Abraham's boy goes there during famine. The king of the Philistines and the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go to Egypt. I know you're headed that way. I know your daddy went there, but he blew it when he went to Egypt. So and, and Oswald Chambers makes the point. God's word to Abraham was go from Ur of the Chaldees. God's word to Isaac is, stay. It's like, 
I know this guy. He's uh, the boy that stayed at home. Dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land. I will be with you. I will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. It's always about Abraham. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven. I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Why is God blessing Isaac? Because of daddy. Because of daddy. It's always because of daddy. Because Abraham obeyed my voice. Not because you obeyed my voice. But because Abraham obeyed my voice. A few comments. I'm putting a little slant on those verses because of where this whole chapter is headed. Um, the Lord appears to Isaac. There's famine in Canaan. So God says, don't go to Egypt like your daddy did. I'm calling him daddy. If you want to write father in the blank, that's okay. But the word daddy has a little different connotation. And I think Isaac had a daddy. Um, Letter B, God renews the covenant he had made with Isaac's daddy. And God tells him that. You know, I made a covenant with your daddy. Now I'm making it with you. But he's always, Isaac is the quintessential son. That's what, he's a son. And letter C, God blesses Isaac because of daddy's obedience. I don't know if Isaac felt put down by that. Um, I don't think so, but it's sort of just reflective of... And, and, okay, let's keep reading uh, verse 6 and following. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. You ever heard that before? How many times have you heard that before? Twice. And one of his daddy pulled this stunt twice. So where did he learn this stunt? From his daddy. And one of the times was when Abraham was in Gerar with Abimelech, telling that previous Abimelech 75 years ago, Sarah's my sister. And he got scolded by that pagan king, and Isaac is about to get scolded. It's like this sounds familiar. Um, for he feared to say, she's my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was drop-dead gorgeous. That doesn't say that. It says, attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw Isaac... What's the word? caressing, what other words you got? Playing. Mine says laughing. It's an interesting word. We talked about it a few weeks ago, but uh, it probably has sexual connotations. Uh, I think the King James says he saw Isaac sporting. I love that word, sporting, with his wife. It's like, that's, that's an interesting word. Um, but Whatever they were doing, Abimelech knew, you guys aren't brothers and sisters. You guys aren't brothers and sisters. Verse 9, so Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she's your wife. How then could you say she's my sister? And Isaac said, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. In my own self-interest, I put my wife in jeopardy. Big jeopardy. Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. This is a pagan talking to a patriarch, giving him a lesson in morality. It's pretty interesting. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife is dead meat. A um, few comments. I'm at, back at the sheet here. Out of fear, Isaac tells the Philistines that Rebekah is his sister. 
his daddy had pulled this stunt twice with Pharaoh in Egypt and with Abimelech in Gerar. Though there are obvious differences in the three incidents, the similarities are striking. A patriarch visits a pagan land and to protect himself pretends his wife is his sister. This invites God's judgment on the land and brings a strong moral rebuke from a pagan king. It's just interesting. Shall we keep going? We're doing good. Because I'm, I'm going to use this as a springboard. So I'm, I'm trying to get through the chapter. We're at verse 12. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very rich. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abraham said to Isaac, Go away from us, because you are mightier than we are. In other words, what makes Isaac hated by the Philistines is not that he's a lying, deceitful man, but that he's rich and God has blessed him. And, and the roots of anti-Semitism, you know, when you, why do people for millennia hate Jews? That, that's, I'm stating it crudely, and I don't mean it to sound crude. That's a very interesting question, but it... I think the Bible would say because God has blessed them. I hate that. I hate it when God does that. <laughs> it's like, really? Is that the proper response? Um, Isaac prospers and the Philistines become jealous. Isaac's prosperity is credited to the Lord's blessing. It doesn't say Isaac prospered because he was a shrewd businessman. It says Isaac prospered because God blessed him. B, jealousy caused the Philistines to do what? To plug up their wells that Abraham had dug earlier and then tell Isaac to leave the territory. Um, look at my footnote there. In other words, in the Middle East, a well is a sign of wealth, particularly if it's an oil well. <laughs> but it's the same concept. It's like, so if your enemy has a well, I think the natural thing to do, well, I'm going to chase my enemy off the land and then use that well, but not if you're a Philistine. It's like, no, I'm going to pl plug up his well. It's like, that's not even bright. I don't, uh, in, in my way of thinking. Le, uh, the footnote, in the Middle East then is now, a well was a sign of prosperity. Rather than taking by force the wells that Abraham had dug, envy and jealousy caused the Philistines, and I added the word to stupidly, fill them with dirt. An act of sabotage, maybe terrorism, that hurt them as much as it hurt the Hebrews. They just blow things up. It's like, that sounds sort of familiar. Let's just tear something down and blow it up. It's a, sort of a Philistine response. Okay, uh, letter C. Isaac redigs the well his daddy had dug and gives them the names his daddy named them. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And, uh, well, I'm going to, that's, this is what I'm going to do. Letter D. Uh, in a book entitled Revival, this is, at least in my way of thinking, it's a famous book by Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's one of the standard books on revival. The first, like, 90 pages 
of that book, Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous Bible expositor in London, middle of the 20th century, is an exposition on Genesis 26, really verse 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped up after the death of Abraham. And Martin Lloyd-Jones just writes 90 pages on that's how revival comes. When you're so thirsty for the water of life that Abraham points us to, and when you realize the Philistines, and he just writes pages on who are the Philistines, have put rubbish in the well that keeps us from accessing the water. And if we're going to find new life, revival, we've got to clean out the rubbish and find the wells of water that Abraham found. It's, that, that's a good sermon. That's a great text, uh, I think. So in his book retitled Revival, Martin Lloyd-Jones uses uh, that as a text to call God's people to clear out the Philistine rubbish and drink again from the living water that Father Abraham made possible. If you want that book, I'll loan it to you. But it's, uh, you, I'm sure it's online, too. Number uh, four. Let's read. Um, yeah, we're doing okay. Pick it up at verse 23. I'm leaving a little bit. Oh, I'm skipping the part where it mentions the four wells. He digs the well of Essek which is the well of contention, and then they leave because they're by fighting. Then he digs the well of Sitna, which is the well of hatred. They fight over that, so he leaves. Then they find the well at Rehoboth, which is the well of broad place. There's room. There's a fair number of usually Baptist churches named Rehoboth Church. It's a it means broad place. It's a, it's a good place. So Isaac digs wells. Verse 23. From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him again. It doesn't say again, but this is the second time. The same night and said, I am who? I'm your daddy's God. It's like, are you my God? I'm your daddy's God. This, that's, I think, pretty significant. I am the God of Abraham, your father. That's not a bad thing, but it feels a little distant. How well does Isaac know God? How well does a second generation Christian, what are the chances of a second generation Christian having an intimate, passionate, living relationship with God? That's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, um, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, I am with you and will bless you. Multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. It's almost as if God is, I was going to say rubbing it in, but I think he's saying, come on, Isaac, are you and I in relationship? Or is this about just you and your daddy's God? relationship. So he built an altar, which is the only altar Isaac ever built. Usually he's digging wells. His daddy was always building altars. But he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord and pitched his tent and dug another well. <laughs> you got to like this guy. He would be great to have for a next door neighbor. Isaac, I think, is about the nicest guy in the Bible. But nice guys, I hate to tell you this, don't change the world. They cut their grass. They pay their taxes. They have a nice white picket fence around their yard. But they're not known for passionate, intimate relationship with God. Um, this is why I like Isaac. Uh, I'm at number four on our sheet. God appears again to Isaac at Beersheba. 
I am the God of Abraham, your father. And Isaac responds by building an altar, his first and only, and he digs another well. And then the last part of the passage, verse 26. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzah, his advisor, and Philcol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away? And they said, We see plainly that the Lord is with you. It's so up, and even a pagan can recognize it, that God is with you. Let us make a covenant. And so they make a covenant. Then verse 32, that same day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug and said, we found water. And he called it Sheba, which becomes Beersheba. Okay? And we'll talk about Esau and his bad marriages. That's the next verse uh, next time we meet. Because of, that's interesting too. All right. I, uh, yeah, we see plainly that the Lord is with you. All right, let's go to letter B. Are we all together? Hey, we're doing, this is, this is good. I'm, the Department of Redundancy Department. You're supposed to laugh at this. This is, uh, when I read Isaac's story, did it sound familiar? And you're supposed to say, yes, Dan, we, it did. Isaac's life seems like an echo of his daddy's life. I, and I, I would just love to know what you're thinking right now, because a lot of us have had parents who were sort of larger than life, or grandparents, sort of Abrahamic figures in our lives. And... Uh, Sometimes we spend our whole lives sort of being an echo of who they were. And is what do you do with that? Uh, the same issues, famine. The same temptations to go to Egypt and to say my wife is my sister. The same wells. The same neighbors, Abimelech. And the same locations, Beersheba. It's like, this is Abraham the second. Number two, the text seems to underscore the reality that all Isaac's blessings are the result of his daddy's faithful obedience and that the God he worships is his daddy's God. And I just put, is this second-hand faith? And the text doesn't really answer that question, but I think it asks the question. And I think it's a very good question. And... Uh, it's one thing, well, when you are an Abrahamic Christian, when you come to Christ out of paganism. It's another thing when you're born into the faith. And like Isaac, you grow up, mom and daddy pray all the time. They read scripture. They go to church on Sunday. They had me circumcised. They didn't consult with me. That's normal. All right. Letter, number three. This is the main paragraph I want to say about Isaac. It's tough being a son. With Abraham's life, we learned it's tough being a father. You may be asked to sacrifice your son. It's hard, it's hard to trust God for your children. That's Abraham. He's the father. He's Father Abraham. Isaac is the son, and uh, his mother pampered him. His father almost killed him. <laughs> I don't know what kind of emotional impact that had for the rest of his life. His uh, servant found his wife for him, and then when he married Rebecca, Rebecca's the one who stopped him from showing favoritism to the wrong son, Esau. It's like he's this sort of passive, life just happens to him. He's not a proactive person, he's reactive. I, this is, I don't know if this is connecting with you, but this accounts for about half the people on the pew on any Sunday. 
people that are, I'm here because mom and dad brought me here since I was a kid. I love God, but he's really my dad's God, and I, I'm not passionate about it, but I'm, I respect God. I cut my grass, I pay my taxes. I even tithe to the church. That's Isaac. It's tough being a son of a great man so that your identity is shaped by someone else. When I go to Georgia, I'm Jack and Ruth Ann's boy. That's, and I, I enjoy that. But it's, I'm not Stan. And, and yeah, it's... Um, Isaac's story, listen to this, is sandwiched between Abraham, who gets 14 chapters, and Jacob, who gets 26 chapters, and Isaac gets chapter 26. In one single chapter that tells us about Isaac's contribution to history. And what does he do? He, dig, he digs wells. It's like, his story is short, and unspectacular. And it's why we love the movie It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey is the boy who stayed at home. His brother goes off to World War II and becomes a hero, but he's a drunk, no good sort of bum. George Bailey stays home and mines the Savings and Loan Association, and he's, but he, he's, his struggle with who am I? And I I want to be a hero, but my life is unspectacular. This is why Isaac's important. Um, while God told Abraham to go from Ur of the Calvary, that's an exciting call. Abraham, leave your country. Set off on an adventure. What does he tell Isaac? Isaac, stay. <laughs> that's George Bailey. That's what I think of. Yeah, Isaac is the George Bailey of the Old Testament. While other patriarchs took exciting journeys, fought important battles, and accomplished great deeds, Isaac, Isaac basically stayed home and dug wells. Like an acorn that falls from a mighty oak tree, his life was lived in the shadow of his daddy Abraham. It's hard to find a great man who had a great son. I thought about Baron Trump this afternoon. What would it be like to be Donald Trump's son? Oh my goodness. I, uh, you might say, well, perks and privileges. Maybe. But I don't think you'll ever be anything in history. Or even a Hunter Biden in these days. <laughs> a Joe Biden's son. It's like, did they have a life of their own? I don't think so. They're marked by their daddy. Okay. Let's, okay. Um, if I was on a big platform, I would put three chairs here in front of me. And that would be my, anybody ever he, see, um, David Wilkerson, not David, uh, Bruce Wilkerson, preach on the three chairs, walk through the Bible. This goes back to the 1990s. Nobody remembers this, the three chairs. I'm, I'm stealing it from him. It's an old enough illustration now to make you think that I thought of it by myself, but I didn't. But it's not about Goldilocks and the three bears, but it's about the three chairs the Abraham chair, first generation Christian. Second chair, the Isaac chair, the second generation. And the third chair is Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Great grandpa, no, yeah, grandpa, pa, and son. And then there's actually a fourth chair in the book of Genesis, the Joseph chair. But Joseph is not one of the patriarchs. We're going to get to Joseph, see how he fits in. But Joseph basically recovers the first chair 
passion when you get to the fourth generation. If, um, so you're, you're tracking with me? Um, so I want to talk about the three chairs. And what we're going to talk about in doing this is not just, I want you to think about your family, whoever your father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and some of us are old enough to think about your children. And the question is, what happens to the faith when it's transferred from one generation to the next? This is maybe the most important question in Genesis. And that's why the Bible talks about Abraham, Isaac. It's got to go from Abraham to Isaac. It's got to go from Isaac to Jacob and all the way to, to us. All right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, here we go. I'm at letter A. Genesis gives a surprising amount of... Oh, I didn't finish my thought. But it's not just true for your families. It's true for churches. It's true for college campuses. It's true for ministries. Um, you know, what happened to the YMCA? I, if, I don't know if that story relates. The Young Men's Christian Association that today is just called the Y. They've dropped the C, if you know that story. Or what happened um, to the United Methodist Church when the faith gets passed from generation to generation? Is that inevitable? Can it be stopped? What should we do about it? I'm so glad you asked. That's the right question. That's the right question. So it's your family, it's your church, your ministries, places like Asbury, places like the Francis Asbury Society. What's going to happen when the torch gets passed? All right? This is... Genesis gives a surprising amount of information about these three men, the patriarchs. Apparently, God wants us to think deeply about what happens to the faith when it gets passed or transmitted or transferred from one generation to the next. In a relay race, the key moment is when the baton is passed from one, one runner to the other. So what happens? All right. Let me just talk you through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, you should know because we've been studying him for about three months. Father Abraham, some general characteristics of first-generation believers. Uh, and this is painting with a broad brush, uh, but I think it works. A, somebody like Abraham knows firsthand the reality of raw paganism. If you'd have gone up to Abraham and said, Abraham, what does it mean to be a pagan? He would have said, oh my goodness, let me tell you, about, let me tell you my story. I used to worship idols. I used to worship idols. I went to the temple. I was there when they practiced child sacrifice in the temple. Or he had stories. It was, he knew what it was. Paganism was not a concept. He knew it firsthand. Letter B, he has a conversion that is clear and dramatic. If you said, Abe, how'd you leave paganism? Abe said, oh my goodness. I heard a voice one day. God said, leave your home. And I left. God saved me. And you would be sitting there just spellbound, listening at the drama of his story. If you'd have asked Isaac that question, you'd get a very different answer. Uh, letter C. Abraham knows God. He doesn't just know about God. He can't just quote verses. He knows God personally. He has a personal relationship. This is not about religion. This is about he, Abraham walks with God. They're, friend, they're buds. <laughs> uh, letter D, he has a faith that is vibrant, bold, and passionate. I got to tell you that when I... When I think of Abraham, this is just very personal, but I think of my mother-in-law. 
Elsie Kenlow. She was converted out of New England blue blood secularism. And when she met Jesus, she just couldn't talk enough about her relationship with him. In fact, she would tell the waitress, embarrass the whole family about, you know, trying to evangelize the waitress in the restaurant. Just, do you know Jesus? Can I pray for you? It was just this, it, you couldn't contain her. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, letter E, wholehearted, full commitment, total consecration, absolute surrender. I mean, it's just, you're all in. That's Abraham. And F, Abraham thinks everybody ought to know God. <laughs> Egyptians, Sumerians, Hittites, everybody needs to know God. So number two, we're still talking about the first chair. This is Abraham's chair. Abraham's life is characterized by altars. There's four of them. At Shechem, at Bethel, at Hebron, and at Moriah. Everywhere Abraham went, he built an altar. It is just beautiful. And what is an altar? An altar is a place of sacrifice, thanksgiving, worship, and communion. Now that's first generation Christianity. Converted out of paganism, clear conversion story, a relationship, passionate, full surrender, and everybody needs to know this. All right. Now what happens... And Genesis has a lot to say about this. When Abraham has a boy, and Abraham wants his son to know what he knows. Okay, very good question. Now let's talk about Isaac. This is the second chair. General characteristics of a second generation Christian. And that's why we just studied Isaac. A, he's or she is born into a family where prayer, faith, Scripture and church are the norm. Every Sunday we go to church. Every night, Daddy reads the Bible. Every time we sit down to a meal, Mom prays. They tithe their money to the church. Don't all families do that? That's normal. That's not paganism. Isaac does not know paganism firsthand. His parents protect him from that wickedness. Wonderful. But what's happening to Isaac? Let letter B, paganism is an outside evil to be avoided at all costs. And we have family rules. In my house, we didn't have playing cards in our house. <laughs> Thank you very much. We had rook cards. But playing cards represented the world. And I used to, we just laughed at that and said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But when the older I get, I realize... No, it was, that's how my mom thought. That, it's, anyway, that, but you're getting the idea. I was raised in a Christian home. My mother wasn't. Playing cards for her meant something very different than they meant to me. That may not be the best illustration, but you're, this is Isaac, the Isaac chair. We have family rules and practices and rights. Isaac? Nobody consulted you, but you were circumcised eight days after you were born. Nobody consulted me, but I was baptized. <laughs> it's like, and then I was told, you've been dedicated to God and Jesus Christ. Okay. It's like a... Letter C, our family is blessed. Oh my goodness, in every way. Daddy's not a drunkard. He's not a gambler. He works hard. He loves his family. And God has blessed us materially. It's true. And letter D, we practice our faith and live moral lives because that is what our parents taught us to do. Tradition, if you know a fiddler on the roof, it's, it's what we do. It's who we are. It may not be about a personal relationship, it's just 
what we do. We may not be passionate about God, but we do worship and respect Him. Number two, Isaac's life is characterized by what? Wells. He built one altar, but his life is not characterized by altars. His life is characterized by wells. Esek, Sitna, Rehoboth, and Beersheba. A well is a place of prosperity, a place where the blessings of life can be enjoyed. Isn't that what life is all about? To enjoy the blessings that have come to us through Daddy's faith? It's a good question. It's a very good question. And I don't know what to do with all this. I just know this is what the Scripture is telling us. It's painting this picture. Now, next week, we're going to start studying Jacob. Oh my goodness. You had a passionate God lover with Abraham. He just couldn't worship and love God enough. He couldn't give God enough. With Isaac, you had a really nice guy who worshiped God. He was moral. Just a really nice guy. With Jacob, you have a... The word jerk comes to mind. But you got a rascal. Third generation. And again, I hope you're thinking of your own family as you're talking. Think, ab think about what happens to the faith. It's not a science. This is not, this is not science. But it, it really helps me when I think about my children, when I think about my parents, and my great-great-grandfather, who's an Abraham, I'm going to mention him in a moment, but a, who's an Abrahamic sort of legend, in the key family. Jacob, third generation. General characteristics of a third generation believer. A, detecting the lukewarm, double-minded, respectable, predictable religion of his father. So now just think for a moment. Isaac grows up in a home watching mom and dad with their passionate, fiery, hot love for God. They pray with fire. Um, Jacob grows up with a mom and dad who go to church every Sunday. They have certain disciplines in the home. They have evening prayer or whatever they do, but there's not, you wouldn't call it fiery. It's just sort of what we do. And sometimes the wells are more important than the church or whatever. It's about enjoying the blessing. Now, what conclusions is a Jacob drawing in that home. Detecting the lukewarm, double-minded, respectable, predictable religion of his father, Jacob fails to see the vital importance of faith in God and concludes, this is how I say it, that faith in God is a department of life or a compartment, sort of like exercise or civil involvement or religion. Or it's useful for emergencies. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's sort of a faith in God is compartmentalized on what we do on the weekend when we go to church. But it doesn't relate to what happens on Monday through the rest of the week. That kind of thought. Or letter B, this third generation finds it easy to rebel. I can't really picture Isaac rebelling. I don't think Isaac had a rebellious bone in his body. But Jacob, oh my goodness, he was a hellion. Uh, that's, that's exactly what he was. Uh, finds it easy to rebel and reject the teachings of their parents and grandparents. They can quickly slip into practices and behaviors that would be shocking to granddaddy Abraham. And just think about your own family. When I think about the gender debates and things like same-sex marriage, and I think about my grandparents, they would not have, and that it was condoned by the church, I, I, the shock of it. 
That's the devolution, the, the generational drift of the faith. Um, immorality, alternate lifestyles, marrying outside the faith, worldliness, selfish ambition. Number two, Jacob's life, you haven't seen this yet, but we'll see it when we get to him, is characterized by what? Pillars. P-I-L-L-A-R-S. There's like four of them. He built pillars. Let me just read it. At Bethel, he built a pillar. It's a pile of stones. It looks a little like an altar, but it's not an altar. It looks sort of like an altar. At Bethel, he built a pillar to commemorate his dream of the Jacob's ladder, the stairway to heaven. He gets up in the morning and say, he doesn't say, I'm going to build an altar. He gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to put a historical marker here. Uh, okay. Um, where else does he do it? At, at Mizpah Galead to commemorate the covenant with Laban and at Bethlehem to mark the grave of Rachel. You can look up these references, but it's the word pillar. Some of your translations may say memorial marker. A pillar resembles an altar and has an air of religiosity, but it has a totally different purpose, like a shrine, memorial, or historical marker. A pillar commemorates something that happened to our ancestors long ago. Fifty years ago, there was a revival. Let's commemorate. Maybe we can put up a monument. Is that wicked? No, that's not wicked. But what does it represent? And that's a very good question. I'm, I'm thrilled we celebrated the revival. I'm not, but I'm illustrating... The Jacob Principle. Okay, now look at, th this is the main thing I want to do with you. Look at the chart. See the chart on the back of the page? Now this is the fun part. This is where we're trying to put it all together. The three chairs. Um, I've, I've given you the answers, at least my answers, on Abraham. Uh, but let's, I'm going to want you to help me. So do you understand what the chart's doing? First generation, second generation, third generation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The symbol for Abraham is an altar. The symbol for Isaac is what? A well. And a symbol for Jacob is a pillar. And we've talked about that, so I think I'm going to keep moving. Um, with God... Abraham, first generation, has a relationship. They talk. They walk together. What about Isaac? Religion. That's the word I put. Isaac had a religion. It was authentic. It was real. But I don't get the impression Isaac just liked to hang out with God. <laughs> I, uh, what about uh, Jacob? Your guess is as good as... I put the word duty. An ob, duty. Obligation. He went to church because mom and dad made him go to church. And then when I think he didn't have to, he didn't go to church. And if you've got other words you want to put in there, I'm welcome. But... Uh, and, and Jacob had two experiences with God. One was his dream of the ladder to heaven. That was when he was running away from home. But that didn't change his character. It put him, it connected him to God, and I think it was his conversion, but it didn't change his jerkness. <laughs> when he was coming back home 20 years later, he had a wrestling match with God, face to face with Almighty God, and he won the wrestling match by losing. And he limped the rest of his life. And uh, oh my goodness, that was when Jacob really met God. Okay, the heart. Abraham 
was all in. Wholehearted faith. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart. That's Abe. What about Isaac? I put half-hearted. If you want to put three-fourths hearted, if you want to put nine-tenth hearted. He loved God with most of his heart. He really did. He, I don't think he was a hypocrite. He loved God. He just also loved Wells. And uh, he had a lot of other things going. What about uh, I, uh, J- Jacob, third heart, third generation? I put hard-hearted. So whole heart, half heart, hard heart. Tell you where else you see this is with David, Solomon, Rehoboam. Oh my goodness. David loved God with all his heart. Solomon loved God with most of his heart. And Rehoboam didn't love God at all. First chair, second chair, third chair. Character. Abraham was holy. I think there was the aroma of holiness. When you were in Abraham's presence, you just sort of wanted to whisper. It was like, wow. He With Isaac, I put the word moral. And then I put slash nice. Anybody know how many times the word nice occurs in the Bible? (laughs) Zero. Now the word gentle and kind are there. Those are good words. But I hate to break it to you, but God's not really interested in nice people, in producing nice people. That may not be the best way to say it. But I say it because I grew up thinking that's what being a Christian was about. Nobody ever told me that, but I drew that conclusion from the churches I went to. I know, oh, I, if I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to be nice. And then I looked in the concordance one day just to check how often that word occurred in God's vocabulary. It sort of changed my worldview. And for the character, Jacob, third chair, I just put the word selfish. With Jacob, it's all about me. It's my getting the birthright, my getting daddy's blessing, my getting Rachel. Jacob's story is, oh my goodness, it's a good one. Uh, Passion. First generation seeks the blessing. Abraham just was always seeking God. Isaac enjoys the blessing. And Jacob demands the blessing. I'm entitled to the blessing. Entitlement. It's my right. Experience. Abraham knows God. Isaac knows about God. He would get 98% on a Bible competence exam. (laughs) Jacob doesn't know God. Not until he wrestles with him all night. And then he says, I'm going to name this place the face of God. I've seen God face to face. The focus. For Abraham, his focus is to please God. I just want to see God smile. Isaac, I think his focus was to please other people. He wanted to see his daddy smile. He wanted to see Rebecca smile. And I think for Jacob, it was to please himself. It's all about me. If I'm happy, that's the point of life, right? That's Jacob. What about the world? For Abraham, he lives for the other world. The kingdom of God. Isaac lives in two worlds. And Jacob lives in this world. (laughs) He's a worldly person. What about the Bible? I put, uh, and this is stretching it a little bit, but I think it works. Abraham eats the Bible. He just consumes when God speaks. He cannot get enough 
of God. Isaac believes in the Bible, and Jacob owns a Bible. <laughs> in fact, he's probably got several translations on his shelf at home, and he's never read one of them. When he does read it, it's boring. But his granddaddy cannot get enough of the Word of God. It's, I, know, I know these people. I know these people. And I just added this one today. It's just how my mind is worked, and it may not be the best way to say it. Evidence of a second work of grace. We saw in chapter 17, I, we called it an old man gets a new start. When, at least, the bottom line is, God gave Abram a new name. You're not Abram. You're Abraham. And at 90 years of age, 99 years of age, Abraham, I think, had a deeper experience of grace. Isaac, can you tell me where he had a deeper experience of grace? This was the first time I'd ever asked this question was today. I can't find it. And his name was never changed. He's always Isaac. And I think Isaac was a good boy who had an authentic relationship with God, but it was a little cool, a little distant, and it never went deeper. Jacob, oh my goodness, he, when he wrestled the angel, I'm just going to put it in bold statement, he was sanctified holy. <laughs> he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He had an experience with God that turned his world inside out. It's, uh, and God said, and we're going to change your name. You're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel. I don't know about you, but I've got all kinds of lights that come on in my mind when I see this. This helps me. When I think about my parents, when I think about my children, and my oldest grandson now is 16, so we're beginning to say, oh my goodness, here we go. Buckle your seatbelt. Um, let me tell you, uh, my cousin Danny's here. He knows this story, but we have an Abrahamic figure in our family tree. Uh, Alexander Chestnut Flanders. Chestnut. Why would anybody name their son Chestnut? <laughs> uh, and he died in 1919. He would be my great-great-grandfather. His last name was Flanders. And he uh, was born yeah, in 1828. Fought with Robert E. Lee. Um, and if I got my story right, supposedly at Spotsylvania, took a Yankee mini ball that grazed his skull and put a crease in his skull. And my dad says he would have his grandchildren put their finger on the crease in his skull and say, that's a Yankee mini ball from Spotsylvania. <laughs> and supposedly walked home from Appomattox, barefoot, you know, after the war. And I don't know at what point he got converted, but he became a shouting Methodist. They did exist in that day, and he didn't have enough education to be ordained an elder, so he was an exhorter. An exhorter was the person who stood up after the preacher preached and made people get to the altar. He was an exhorter, Grandpa Chess. But in his latter years, and this story is told a hundred times in our family, he began to pray that God would raise up preachers out of his family. That was what he prayed, that God would raise up preachers of the gospel. And there's been like 60. It's, it's a large number. And in the picture, he's got hair down to his show, white hair, big beard. He looks like Abraham, you know. And, um, and we all owe him a debt, Father Abraham, that... You know, he's just this sort of legendary figure. And how much of his story is true and false, I don't know. But uh, we're all indebted to it. But 
What has happened? Let me tell you one other story. I, I, I've got to tell you this. This is good. This is good. And I, I'm done. I don't know. I'm trying to help you apply this in your setting, particularly in your family. Our daughter, um, Elizabeth, when she was at Asbury College, this would be 2008 or so, but she had a good friend named Megan, Megan Holton. And Megan was from Connecticut, and we had met her because we lived 40 miles from Connecticut. When, when we learned somebody from Connecticut was going to Asbury, oh my goodness, that was big news. So we got to know, and Megan was from a very traditional sort of New England secular family. They sort of went to church, but Megan had met Jesus at a concert, and she, at some concert, somebody was wearing a jersey from Asbury, and she said, where's that? But she ended up at Asbury, to the chagrin of her parents. But one day at chapel, the chapel speaker spoke and mentioned the name Dwight L. Moody. And after chapel, Megan said to her friends, why are they talking about Dwight L. Moody in Kentucky? And her friends said, what kind of question is that? Because he's the greatest evangelist of the 19th century. And Megan said, he is? And they said, why do you want to know? She said, because he's my great granddaddy's brother. And we have his carriage in our home and some of his Bibles. My dad has them, but I didn't know he was a Christian. <laughs> she didn't know Dwight L. Moody was a Christian. She said, we knew he started a prep school called Mount Hermon in Massachusetts. And he started a school in Chicago, but we don't know much about. But my dad, but the prep school in Massachusetts is not a Christian school. It's not. It's a sort of a trendy prep school. But she said, I didn't know he was a Christian. I knew he, I knew he was religious. So she went home to her dad and said, Dad, was Dwight Moody a Christian? Her dad said, yeah, but we don't quite know what to do with that or something. But Megan, anyway, she's been a missionary. She works now in the suburbs of Detroit with Muslims. But the point is, the point is, she had an Abraham, I mean a real Abraham, <laughs> in her family that she didn't even know the influence of. And then about four generations later, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Joseph is the Abrahamic, he gets it. And Megan, oh my goodness, if you met Megan, she's just contagious with faith in Jesus. It's just, that's a good story. All right, let me pray with you. I don't know, I was, uh, This is when we just need to circle our chairs up, and I would just want to say, tell me your story, but, uh, or tell me what you're thinking. But let me pray. Lord, I want to thank you for how helpful tonight has been to me just to try to make sense out of maybe the most important thing in life, and that is the next generation. And we pray that you would use your word, not even to answer our questions, but just to help us understand and to do what we can do to stop the insidious generational drift that will happen if we're not vigilant. It will happen in our families. It'll happen in our churches. It'll happen to our college campuses. It'll happen to ministries, even like Francis Asbury Society, if we're not vigilant to do all we can do in the power of your Spirit to pass on an authentic faith to the next generation. Uh, thank you for reminding us of the importance of those we love the most. We do pray for our children and our grandchildren. We do plead with you 
to set a fire in their hearts and bring them to yourself. Uh, keep speaking to us even as we sleep. In Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom. Amen.